Yes, dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Barbara Plankensteiner and I'm the curator of the African Art Department here at the Yale University Art Gallery. And it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Peter Breunig, who joined us from Germany, to speak on the Noc Terracotta Enigma this evening. He only recently returned to Germany from a field trip to Namibia, where he is researching spectacularly new discovered rock art close to Twyfelfontein. We are very happy that he made it to New Haven, because until yesterday morning, uh, it was un unclear that he could fly because there was a major sh strike at Frankfurt Airport. So he's here now and we're very glad. I first met Peter Breunig when I visited his excavation site uh, at Nok in central Nigeria in 2008, um, where he showed me around and I was deeply impressed to see what they're doing and excavating. And I'm really glad that he accepted to give this lecture and spare some time out of his busy schedule. Peter Breunig is a professor at the Goethe University in Frankfurt since 1992 and is head of the African Archaeology Department. His research focused on rock art in southwestern uh, Africa, on cultural de development and its interdependency with climate and vegetation changes in the West African savanna and in Central Africa. He has undertaken archaeological field research in Burkina Faso, Namibia, and Nigeria. He is also the editor of the Journal of African Archaeology. We invited Peter Breunig to talk about knock art and culture, his most recent and renowned research project, because as you might know, the Yale University Art Gallery owns the largest museum collection of knock terracotta art and related cultures in the country, thanks to a donation in 2010 by Susanna and Joel Gray, who are here with us today. Um, the knock culture, named after a village close to the first site of discovery is famous for its, its clay figures, some even almost life-sized, which are the oldest known examples of sculptural art in West Africa. In addition, the smelting furnaces from Noxites further showed evidence for early metallurgy in West Africa. The discovery of Nox art goes back to accidental finds from deposits in open tin mines made in the mid-1940s. An earlier piece, one single piece, has been found in 1928. First archaeological uh, excavations have been organized by the British archaeologist Bernard Fagg in the 1950s and 60s. The terracotta sculptures became largely known with Bernard Fagg's publication on knock art in 1977. It took another 40 years until new investigations have been made. In 2005, Peter Breunig and his team started a long-term archaeological project on Nok in collaboration with the Nigerian Commission for uh, Museums and Monuments in Nigeria and funded by the German Research Council that is still ongoing today and has yielded some really fascinating results that he will present to us today. In 2013, his he and his team organized an exhibition at the Liebig House Museum in Frankfurt um, where they showed their findings and excavations from the NOC uh, research. And um, this museum is in Frankfurt. And the catalog published along with the exhibition has become the major source book for NOC art and culture since Bernard's fact early publication in the 70s. The lecture will take approximately an hour, and after that there is room uh, for questions, and after we invite you for a reception in the lobby. So please welcome Peter Breunig. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. The strike indeed uh, did keep me very nervous until, uh, until the end. Um, maybe I, you allow me to start that uh, English was my worst subject in school. <laughs> uh, and uh, my late uh, English teacher would not believe what I try to do here. He more would say you will not be able to complete one sentence without any mistake. Uh, <clears throat> well, nevertheless, um, 
I, I would not like to read uh, a well-written academic paper because I do not like such presentations. I always find it quite boring. So please, I apologize uh, for the struggles with uh, grammar and uh, vocabulary, but nevertheless, I hope uh, I can explain what I want uh, to explain here. Uh, I have the pleasure to invite you to follow me to Nigeria in West Africa uh, to a place called Nock. In, if I talk in Germany about uh, this topic, uh, Nock is always mixed with the National Olympic Committee. Uh, <laughs> this is, of course, not uh, the case here. Uh, we go to a village approximately in the center of Nigeria. Uh, and whenever you consult textbooks uh, or the web about prehistoric art in Africa, you sooner or later will come uh, across Nok. This is a few of the village, not really uh, uh, impressive or specific, uh, but for some inhabitants still it's the home of civilization. And there is a misunderstanding that the whole Nok culture was born in this area. But uh, you might be aware that in science, Sometimes entities are simply labeled according, according to the place where the materials uh, first have been discovered. Uh, but for African archaeology, uh, this is one of the most famous villages in Africa. Uh, it's famous because uh, during colonial times, uh, this uh, just has been mentioned, uh, there had been tin mining activities, open air tin mining, all these holes where uh, were dug by manpower, uh, and in such alluvial deposits, which can go down more than 10 meters and so, uh, there had been made some discoveries. The very first one uh, in 1928, here in such a tin mine very close to Nock, uh, it was classified as an anthropomorphic figurine or as a monkey and uh, disappeared somewhere in a collection of curiosities uh, in the box of the owner of the tin mine. <clears throat> Some decades later, the other uh, find was made in uh, 1943 at a site called Jema'a, uh, after it uh, was used as a scarecrow for a whole year. Uh, and uh, then it came into the attention of a young British archaeologist uh, his name already was mentioned, Bernard Fack, uh, who uh, was trained in archaeology, but he was in charge for other things in Nigeria. Then he came across these finds. He realized that there is something special with the objects. First, he saw that they are very similar uh, in some aspects, like the particular uh, appearance of the eyes, the uh, elaborated hairdo, and even the size of one of these hats, so the right one uh, is almost life-size. Uh, since art is related very close to culture, he classified uh, these objects as knock culture. Also, today we are a little bit careful with such kind of expressions because cultures means a little bit more than just a few uh, terracotta objects. Bernard Fack organized further research and uh, very soon uh, came across more discoveries in, in other uh, tin mines, but all from alluvial deposits. That means not in original primary position, but somewhere removed from, uh, from let's say, from higher level washed down into such deposits. 70 sites until 1977 were found, located between uh, Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, and uh, the metropolis of Jos on the Jos Plateau, and uh, most clustered around the center, but you see one was far in the north and another one uh, far in the south, uh, 600 kilometers distance from each other. Uh, and uh, if you plot uh, the area uh, with a circle, you will get about 100,000 square kilometers. Uh, I have checked that this is about seven times the size of Connecticut, so quite a respectable, respectable uh, distribution. Uh, he found approximately 100 fragments of terracotta. A few are shown here. Uh, I would underline fragments, not one piece uh, is uh, totally uh, is complete. <clears throat> then um, the dating, of course, was a very exciting matter. Um, it was a little bit a kind of a guesswork, geological guesswork. 
going up to East Africa to find relation in deposit sequences. But it was also the years when radiocarbon uh, was uh, developed or produced the first dates or other dating techniques like thermoluminescence. They scatter over a long period, uh, as uh, indicated here, for up to 1000 BC. But Bernard Feck did not dare uh, to take the whole time span as the duration of the knock culture, but proposed a duration from 500 BC to about 200 AD. And this is the period which uh, the dating still uh, you can find in many publications. Today, things have changed a little bit. Nock became famous for the oldest large-scale sculptures in sub-Saharan Africa. There was nothing similar known in these days before. But there was also uh, another discovery uh, produced by excavations in a site called Taruga. This was in the 1960s. Uh, this was the first excavation where material, also terracotta, uh, was not found deep in the ground in alluvial deposits, but very close to the surface, possibly in an area where a uh, former settlement uh, existed. Uh, <clears throat> but the most important from Taruga was the discovery of iron furnace, uh, iron smelting furnaces, also dated by radiocarbon to around the middle of the first millennium BC, and in these days, uh, the earliest iron in sub-Saharan Africa. So terracotta and iron knock became an enigmatic complex. Uh, these two, uh, uh, these two uh, materials. Uh, placed as the earliest uh, evidence so far known in Africa. Not much happened afterwards. We just heard that the publication by FAC uh, appeared in 1977. Uh, there had been some small test diggings afterwards carried out by his daughter or by a Nigerian scholar, Joseph Jemkur. Uh, and, um, but mostly what appeared afterwards was there some exaggerated ideas uh, were produced about Knox. So you can find this uh, idea where the Knox terracotta might have been used standing in a temple where there is no archaeological evidence for any kind of this temple, or that uh, other researchers uh, had the idea, what, aware that it's pure speculation, uh, that the extensive production of iron created the material basis for an early kingdom near Nock Kingdom. That is quite an exciting hypothesis. Uh, and that the king of this state would then have had the wealth to be able to give patronage to artists who in turn created the new kind of sculptures. No, this was the speculation uh, in these days. Nevertheless, Nock terracotta became uh, very popular also in the international art market. And if you check the internet, this is what I did a few days ago, uh, you will see that some of these objects are sold for 120,000 US dollars. Even bodies without head or leg uh, can bring up to 9,000 dollars. So <clears throat> if you know Nigeria, and I know Nigeria since 30 years, uh, such a kind uh, of possibility to make cash money, of course, will be used very intensively. And the result uh, is that the objects were uh, excavated by illicit digging uh, from local inhabitants. Uh, you see one example here. This is already a couple of years ago, where the whole site is turned upside down and perforated landscapes are left. <clears throat> involved are the villagers, and uh, we were told by those dealers who organized this kind of looting, uh, up to 300 people who scatter such a site in less than a week. And then uh, you can imagine uh, that uh, the whole archaeological or scientific context is totally uh, destroyed. We know a little bit the way these objects then go. There are, of course, local dealers. Even the traditional rulers are involved in this kind of business. Uh, the administration is aware, but uh, they don't know, or yeah, actually they don't know how to stop this. Here, another example, uh, also excavated some years ago, carried out by uh, a collaborator in the meantime here, Mr. Kishimi, 
uh, who was active in digging uh, throughout the 1990s and uh, well actually until the last few years so he he knows quite well what was going on on these sites you see the pits are not uh, refilled and the land is useless uh, for farming Kishimi told us that at this site, but in many others as well, many full body, how they call it, that means complete figurines and so-called passports. This is the upper part of the body uh, we find in, uh, in, these, uh, in these holes. The looting still continues until now. This is uh, a picture taken in January where not very large teams like before, but smaller teams here, only four were involved. Uh, operate by trial and error. Uh, they were looking, like you can see here, for what they call gira. Gira is a Hausa word and means sign, and sign means uh, charcoal, sometimes pottery, or any kind of cultural deposit in the ground. If they hit by these uh, small digging, something like this, they continue um, deep in the ground, uh, supposing that, and this is really the case in, in most cases, uh, the deposits derive from the knock culture. So if, if they are successful, digging continues in a way you can see here, following cultural deposits deep in the ground, the diggings sometimes go down uh, to two meters and more. The archaeological context is totally uh, destroyed. I mentioned before, uh, there had been hundreds of laborers now. Uh, this, uh, the, apparently, the business is going down a little bit. There are small teams, uh, and uh, they work for some weeks on such a site. But after this, the whole area is ransacked uh, over, uh, over hectares. It was always my dream to come across to such a site and have scientific excavation before the looters do the job, uh, because if this would be possible, many uh, or let's say the, the knock enigma uh, possibly could, would have been solved in the meantime. The looters are only looking for terracotta, for, uh, if possible for complete terracotta. Things uh, they cannot sell uh, will remain at the site, indicated here by the arrow. Many fragments uh, and archaeologists are used to work with uh, fragmentation uh, so we can take a lot of information out of this, and uh, <clears throat> therefore we collect them, or even the diggers bring them to us because they know we still use them. Uh, and uh, in our field laboratory, the enormous, enormous quantities were cleaned and, um, and recorded. <clears throat> Broken treasures uh, with a lot of information and many details. Here you see a few examples uh, like uh, part of the of the head indicating the hairdo uh, or body parts, uh, some arms with uh, bracelets, uh, legs, uh, even we have so many legs in the meantime that it would be possible to make a typology of the knock, uh, of the knock legs. And some parts are very exciting, uh, like here, uh, the head uh, of a snake. <coughs> The international art market is flooded by objects from looted sites. Uh, here are some masterpieces. Uh, maybe you know or you saw before the one in the center, which is standing in the Louvre. But uh, it's also possible that some of them might be fakes. In particular, the left one, I, I have my doubt that this is an original one. We never, we never found any uh, remain so far, which indicate horses or animals uh, uh, like this. And fakes are, <coughs> uh, are a good business. Uh, the illicit diggings cannot satisfy the demands on the market. So we uh, came into contact with people involved uh, in making this kind of fakes, and we even were allowed to document their work. Uh, at the starting point of uh, this kind of copies is uh, to use uh, original fragments. So somehow uh, the fakes uh, have a little bit of original material inside. The fragments were ground and then the grounded material or the powder is added to the clay. So at least homeopathic traces of original uh, terracotta is involved. 
The terracotta we observed and we analyzed from our excavated materials were made in a coil technique, as you can see here. Uh, this is the only tool, uh, <coughs> a pointed twig of a hard wood, which is used to make this kind, uh, we see it here in action, separating uh, the upper and the lower leg by cutting a groove, or here by decorating uh, a waste bale. All this is a job of a few minutes. Uh, here you see a bracelet, a bracelets are made and a necklace and uh, the job is almost complete here. This is what they call the philosopher, where the chin is lying on top of the uh, folded arms and the very last step is to groove the pupils, somehow the symbolic procedure uh, to make a person alive. Three hours and Audu Washi has completed uh, the philosopher. This is one kind uh, to, to, to make copies of Noc Terracotta. There is another one which is even more sophisticated. Sometimes the diggers can find pieces like this. If they were not brought to us in our area, they are used as parts in, uh, <coughs> in, uh, in, uh, in Terracotta, using the original fragment which cannot be sold and uh, integrated in uh, uh, figurines like this here. A man kneeling on a pot turned upside down with raised arm and an open hand to carry something, uh, maybe a spear. This is the work which takes a little bit longer. It was about three days and uh, then afterwards uh, a kind of, of post-processing. It is burned in, uh, in charcoal uh, and uh, soil from original noxides is filled into the interior of the terracotta. Uh, so if one think French colleagues once had the idea to do so, to check in inside the terracotta for charcoal remains and make radiocarbon dating, you will get a proper date because the charcoal is original nock. But the figurine has nothing to do with nock apart from the few fragments which were, which were used. Uh, why they do this might be for some kind of ritual relation uh, to, to, to give them uh, an original appearance. This, for this reason, they also attach uh, soil uh, as a kind of patina uh, to let them sh uh, give them a looking uh, as if they are embedded in the ground. Well, this is the final product, uh, ready to be sold, but in this case, it now decorates my office. Barbara Blankensteiner mentioned that we started in 2005. This is a story for its own why we did that. I was in Nigeria uh, a long time before working in the Chad Basin, <coughs> and we discovered, uh, let's say, the beginning of the dentary farming communities and uh, a, a very intensive cultural change around the middle of the first millennium uh, with uh, evidence of uh, complex societies large settlements, uh, mass production of pottery, uh, population, a large population, intensive harvest uh, and uh, the increase of the storage capacity, a lot of other things, around 500 BCs in the Chad Basin. Uh, and uh, one of the points to look at NOC was to check whether there are similar developments in other parts of West Africa. And of course, uh, simply, if you see the sophisticated uh, art of the knock culture, one can imagine that uh, uh, somehow a complex uh, community uh, was behind this. So we had a kind of pilot study in 2005. My students and collaborators uh, uh, made a very proper preparation. Nigeria is not an easy country, and here they got some first uh, information how to behave there. In the first year, the, we spent most energy to find knock sites. <clears throat> For the foreigner, it's not easy to just to walk around, even if, if it is many kilometers like here. Uh, foreigners will not find uh, sites where you just start digging uh, in, in the hope to, to excavate knock terracotta. Nothing from knock sites is visible on the surface. And the landscape is beautiful in a, a immense uh, 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 dimension and a very frustrating matter 
uh, <clears throat> to find uh, in this mountainous area uh, noxites. So we uh, used local informants, or at least got contact to local informants through our Nigerian colleagues, who know noxites simply because they already were digging at these sites. This, by the way, is not far away from Nok. Nok just is on the other side, maybe 10 kilometers, and there are many Nok sites in this area. The, uh, our informant was Umaro Potiskum, you, whom you see here. Uh, he somehow did grow up with Tadakota because his father, Yusuf Potiskum, was the right hand of Bernard Fack uh, and helped, did help him to uh, localize uh, more materials in the tin mining area. Today, Umaro is a dealer, uh, and um, nevertheless, he enabled us direct access to knock sites. Uh, and here you see the not very spectacular beginning of digging. Uh, it's checked in less than one day whether this is a knock site or not by uh, having diagnostic find materials, which we did not know in the beginning, but this is research. If you start, you soon will learn what is typical or diagnostic for knock and what not. So the upper part uh, is not knock. It's a kind of objects with these raised dots or the decoration of the pottery is something which took place later. And this kind of iron tools also have not been found in knock context so far. Typical on the other way are these materials in the lower row. Uh, pottery with a specific decoration, and of course, the knock terracotta. We carried out many test diggings, small trenches uh, located between the uh, looted areas, because the sites are not totally in every uh, corner looted between the individual holes. There still are deposits which have not been affected uh, by the diggings. <clears throat> in some cases, successful, for instance, uh, uh, discovering uh, features like the one you see below here, a semicircle stone setting, which gives some ideas how the knock sites might have been organized. Or uh, knock terracotta in a stratigraphic uh, context associated with charcoal, and therefore uh, there is a possibility to get a radiocarbon date and to learn about the age of the knock culture. Of course, we have incorporated local people and colleagues uh, from the university and trained them to do specific jobs like Fatima. She was trained by our archaeobotanists and later learned how to extract all chart or all organic material from the deposit, which then will be analyzed under the microscope and which give us idea uh, what kind of crops or what kind of food was planted or even to identify the species of wood uh, to get some information about the uh, appearance of the environment. Obadia, on the other hand, uh, a young man from the village uh, where we are working, learned to operate the total station, a big job uh, because in the excavation every find was from the beginning uh, measured in a three-dimensional grid. Within three years, until 2008, <clears throat> we discovered 30 new sites somehow in the vicinity of those uh, which uh, already were known uh, to Bernard Fack. Uh, we have not studied very intensively the southern area and the north, so today we have the impression that the knock culture might be, uh, might be more focused in the central uh, area between uh, Abuja and Jos. Digging provided abundant terracotta fragments. You see them here. Uh, Bernard Fack, uh, after a few decades, had 150 uh, objects. Within a few years, we, we had more than, from one side, almost 1,700 uh, pieces uh, from terracotta. So a very solid uh, base to uh, <clears throat> get some more information about the stylistic variation of the pottery. Omni the art seems to be omnipresent, but uh, still, they all are broken. There is not one single complete terracotta until uh, these days, and until today, we don't have any one. So uh, if I see in the internet or in the art market complete terracotta, uh, we are very careful whether this might not be produced by those people 
able uh, to make what the market is asking for, but the, the, the diggers cannot provide. <clears throat> Besides terracotta, all other uh, categories of find materials we normally have in archaeology are found like iron objects, uh, abundant pottery, uh, in some cases uh, stone uh, beads or kind of adornment, uh, and uh, other stone artifacts like grinding equipment or ground stone axes and these uh, stone balls uh, down on the right. Then it was um, uh, very important that the German Research Foundation in 2009 decided to have a 12-year funding for further research and the very beginning was to establish a research station uh, which you see here. Uh, <coughs> We got land from the local ruler in the vicinity and means and support uh, to construct buildings which can host up to 30 participants. Uh, and the constant presence of our team, uh, at least in the first years before it became difficult in Nigeria uh, because of uh, the political situation to go there with young students, uh, it was very, the constant presence was uh, of particular importance uh, because there was a kind of confidence between our team and uh, those people living in the village uh, next by. Uh, all inhabitants of this village were diggers. The one you know already, this is Kishimi, who did show us the sites behind us, his brother. Uh, after Two or three years of our presence, they did show, they present all their knowledge about noxides, and we very soon uh, uh, got an idea about the quantity of, uh, <coughs> of materials which had been there. This is the situation in 2008. Just a few sites seen or interpreted as a sign of high density and chosen as a study area. And after two years of survey and with the help of the information from the local inhabitants, we got an unrespected result of more than 200 sites in that small area, which is, you see, 15 kilometers east-west and 20 kilometers north-south. That means, statistically, uh, 1.8 knock site in each uh, square kilometer. Let me jump to the present because we have continued uh, the uh, <clears throat> the uh, location of, of NOC sites um, and the density uh, of sites recorded so far it seems to show that NOC sites appear all over in central Nigeria. Until the mid-2040, we had located, with the help of local uh, people who partly were involved in digging these sites, we have located almost 600 sites, not individual finds, like, let's say, a fragment of terracotta and a few potsherds, but settlements of one or two or even more hectares in size. They are all destroyed by looting, and uh, you can understand, uh, for me as a scientist, the loss for science is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is unbelievable. The knock culture will disappear. It's only a question of time. And this was one of the arguments for the funding of our project to rescue information from the ground, what can be done at the moment. If you see this density of sites, they cannot all be kingdoms or cities. Or uh, <laughs> We have in the meantime the impression uh, that all these sites uh, are uh, an indication of a kind of dispersed settlement system. The sites are very small, less than one hectare. We can identify the, the size of the sites because uh, this is one benefit of the digging. The, the diggers will dig as long as is their material in the ground. So somehow the holes on the surface we can, uh, we can measure today or we can see today more or less reflect the dimension of the site uh, which is buried in the ground. Small quantity of sites also point to, uh, to that is not a big settlement, that is a small, well, a hamlet or a homestead or a small village. And there are also no substantial stratigraphies indicating that there was a constant uh, occupation over a long period. So the conclusion, no town, no villages, but dispersed settlements, decentralized settlement system, possibly looking like this example you see here of a Fulani camp in our study area. 
<clears throat> one focus in the beginning of the project was the dating and the chronology. This is the uh, uh, assumption of Bernard Fack in the beginning, um, 500 BC to 200 AD. And after the measurement of, in the meantime, it's more than 200 radiocarbon dates, uh, the situation has changed completely. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, this, uh, the summit, uh, the sum probability density of all these uh, sites. It goes a little bit too much in statistic to explain that here. Simply, the curve will indicate where we have uh, evidence of the dating of the Nook culture. And uh, <coughs> all radiocarbon dates are made from annually growing plants. That means seeds from, from some grasses, from millet, for instance. So they are very precise and uh, have not the problem Bernard Fact was facing that uh, by dating wood, which can have an initial age of, uh, of uh, several hundred years already. Now, the duration of the whole complex uh, uh, has changed. The beginning seems to be around 1500 BC until uh, the beginning of our area. There is a subdivision in uh, three phases, uh, as archaeologists normally do, early, middle, and late, and corresponding uh, to the emergence, the boom, and the collapse of a well-defined archaeological complex. The phases uh, are defined by a change of the pottery. <coughs> uh, we have excavated over the years approximately 90,000 potsherds from 42 excavations, and 15,000 are decorated and had been analyzed uh, by a collaborator in, uh, in a PhD. She has, Gabi Franke, has uh, uh, defined seven different stylistic groups. Uh, uh, I will not go through all these groups, maybe just indicate that the, the second half of the second millennium uh, is uh, <coughs> characterized by a pottery decoration which more or less covers the whole of the, the, whole of the body of the pot. Then in the middle phase, uh, there is a concentration of this decoration in a band uh <coughs> demarcated by incised lines and uh, in the late knock period, uh, there is again an extension of the bands. In the first millennium AD, what still was uh, uh, knock culture according to the dating of Bernard Fack, the pottery is totally different, a totally different technique used by, uh, as a roulette where some carved wood, for instance, were rolled over the pottery leaving a very uh, sophisticated technique which has not been used in the knock culture. We therefore stop the uh, duration of the knock culture around the change of the era. Plant uh, food has been studied, I mentioned it already, through archaeobotanical sampling, uh, and uh, there are cultivated plants right from the beginning. That means the knock culture is a culture of sedentary farmers. They plant uh, millet uh, uh, and uh, cowpea uh, from the middle knock period and used a vari variation of wild plants, in particular at the late knock period. This makes the knock culture not to what it has been before as an early Iron Age uh, complex, but we are now, uh, we are now uh, considering the knock culture as, uh, as the beginning, what we call in Europe Neolithic, or let's say the beginning of sedentary farming communities. <coughs> The three phases witnessed the emergence of important cultural and economic innovation. First, as mentioned, farming, then the sculptural art, and third, uh, iron. Uh, we are here in an art museum, so I think I will focus on the art and will not talk uh, about the iron. Uh, <coughs> The terracotta do not appear from the beginning. This is, in the meantime, quite sure. We have not found any terracotta objects uh, in the second millennium BC. They appear in the early middle knock phase, and the question is, why do farmers start to produce abundant terracotta sculpture after the, the whole culture existed already since 500 years? 
we have a problem with radiocarbon date in this period. Uh, the production of radiocarbon in the upper atmosphere was not constant or not according to a model which can produce a linear, uh, linear relation between the true age and the radiocarbon age. That means we cannot date very precise between 800 and 400 BC. Any date from this period uh, cannot uh, cannot identify either 800 or 400. And this is a lot of problem because many uh, radiocarbon dates we have produced fall into this, uh, what we call the Hallstatt Plateau because it's the period of Hallstatt <coughs> in European prehistory. But a few of these datings from terra associated uh, with terracotta uh, clearly uh, are dated uh, to 800 to 900 BC, that means before the plateau. So for this reason, it's possible that the whole uh, complex of the Nock culture is a very brief event, and that all the other dates which we have going up to 400 BC are somehow an artifact produced by the problems we have with the calibration of the radiocarbon dates. If this is the case, that the knock culture were produced only in a one or two hundred centuries, this would explain why we cannot see any, so far, any clear stylistic development within the whole complex. <clears throat> where are they coming from is another, uh, uh, another important question. There are no predecessors known. From the Chad Basin, we know these tiny uh, clay figurines which are dated to the second and to the first millennium BC, but I think you agree uh, this cannot, this has nothing to do uh, with knock terracotta. <clears throat> maybe objects, if, they, uh, if the knock terracotta had a longer tradition, maybe there had been object, objects in the early period of this complex which has been made by perishable materials, uh, for instance, like wood. Uh, I would like to show you a few examples of those terracotta which we have excavated. There's a very solid database, a few thousand pieces in the meantime, and we were allowed uh, with the permit of the uh, respective authorities to uh, bring them to Germany and uh, study them under laboratory analysis. Most of them are from a well-documented context, uh, which is part of a another PhD program. Animals are extremely rare. <clears throat> uh, it's, and uh, we would be happy to have more information about the animals because no bones have survived in the acid soil of the uh, area of the knock culture. For that reason, we don't know what kind of domestic animals they used. But uh, those animals which are uh, produced by the knock culture are very hard to identify. At least the species uh, only in some uh, rare occasions uh, be identified. But there are no domestic animals. We should expect cattle, goat, or sheep. But what we find are mostly snakes or lizards. Uh, a few examples you see here. There is a double-headed lizard on a pot. The right face is broken, but it's, you can see the beginning of the eyes, which is in a typical knock experience. Uh, then uh, <coughs> snakes are attached on uh, vessels here. This is the head uh, of a snake uh, going around on the um, rim of the pot. Uh, and uh, sometimes they appear as single objects, as you see them here or here. Snakes are very important, and if you go into the ethnographic literature, you will see that snakes have a high ritual significance, which possibly also did, uh, did exist in the knock culture. Here, snakes, uh, you see an example for snakes with an interaction with some human figures. This one we call the snake man. Uh, three snakes are clamped under uh, each arm, and one snake is in each hand uh, looking uh, as a sign of the total control of snakes. Most terracotta show humans. They are all similar in the position, in the decoration, in faces, and particular in the, uh, in the shaping of the eye and the hairdo or the headgear. But none are identical. They all show individuals. 
but somehow they uh, appear united by a similar appearance. Possibly uh, the uh, similarity of all these human figures is that they do not show people alive, but uh, maybe people which are, who are dead. Here, this one has wings on the back for which we have no explanation. Some have very bizarre faces. Uh, this one uh, in our team is co called the Homer Simpson. <laughs> Another unusual uh, figurine, uh, this is from a site uh, which was looted in January and thrown away. Uh, it's a man wrapped in a blanket or a coat. You can see the legs here. Uh, one hand is visible, the face was up here. Uh, he's sitting on a pot turned upside down. Uh, face and the upper body is highly damaged. And the blanket, and this is a funny, uh, funny something, is decorated with two uh, human faces uh, here, uh, also uh, in a typical Knox style. Faces sometimes also appear as decoration on ceramic vessels. We get a lot of exciting information from the terracotta. For instance, here from this one, uh, indications of a far distance contact. Uh, it's the upper body of a friendly looking man because of the beard excavated about two uh, years ago. <clears throat> what we thought in the beginning is a, a, a strange kind of hairstyle uh, was after careful examination nothing else but the, but the a copy of a shell muscle. I think you may agree. Uh, we gave uh, uh, we gave the object to experts who are able to identify such kind of muscles, and uh, the result was quite astonishing. This is a marine uh, sea shell, and the sea from the distribution area of the find spot is about 700 kilometers further to the south. That means somehow objects were transported, or at least the knowledge from such objects were transported over such large distances. Maybe here you, uh, uh, I sh want to show you that the eyes of the muscle men uh, are not in a horizontal line, but they are somehow sloping. Uh, this is uh, not a unique matter. We have uh, found this in many other uh, cases, not knowing uh, what is the meaning behind. <coughs> uh, terracotta sometimes show details which go beyond decoration. Uh, this is one example where we possibly have an indication of weapon. Uh, in the beginning, we were claiming that these were very peaceful people. We couldn't find any uh, in the in the lithic uh, 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 material or in the iron objects any project uh, points. Uh, we uh, saw no weapons uh, on the on the terracotta depicted. But here, if you see this. Or, or maybe this, we, in the meantime, we think that these uh, are weapons used to throw sling stones. A ball is attached to a rope, sometimes uh, with a handle, and such stones are very, very common in almost every site. Uh, they have an average weight of t between 200 and 400 gram, and those local people who still know that this kind of weapon was used uh, in antiquity uh, claim that this is the proper the proper weight you, you, you need for this kind of weapon. Evidence of bows also had been found. <clears throat> Many arms carry what we uh, originally thought are bracelets, uh, but an alternative is a kind of an airbag or an arm protector uh, to absorb the rebounding bowstring. Uh, this is well, a uh, well-known equipment to archers. Uh, here you see an ethnographic example from uh, Burundi, and uh, the open hand, oops, sorry, that was too fast. And the open hand, which is very common among uh, many fragments of knock arms, possibly uh, was carrying or represents uh, remains of the bow. Sometimes even uh, here, the, um, the bow and the string uh, is visible. So the knock culture. Um, not surprising, but there is evidence that they used bow and arrow. Then there are terianthropic creatures. Here a man uh, with carnivore teeth and possibly a decoration 
which should indicate a leopard on the nose. The head is covered by a cap and the ears are in an anatomically impossible position. Another mixture between animal and man, this is the bird man, the human skull with decoration, human eyes and nose, and here if you remove the lower part you see there is a mighty beak uh, of a bird. <coughs> Many figurines are known, some show couples or twins, here two examples in a charming uh, position, and uh, there are <coughs> many uh, portraits or, or, or mm, let's say, decoration of maybe uh, ritual pots uh, which provide uh, information like the one you see here. This was attached to a, to a large vessel. It's a boat, uh, two men holding uh, paddles and transporting uh, goods which cannot be identified, but uh, possibly yams, uh, roots which cannot be um, identified through archaeobotanical uh, examination. This is the only evidence, or a very important evidence, that the Nok people used watercraft, and the second oldest evidence for watercraft in the prehistory of Africa. The other one is 8,000 years old, is also from Nigeria, uh, and was uh, excavated by my team uh, in 2094. Another important uh, story, somebody uh, 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 is sitting on and beating a drum which is fixed on a rope uh, hanging over the shoulder. To my knowledge, the, uh, uh, the oldest evidence of uh, music uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. All examples I have shown you here, and we can continue for hours, uh, are from the key study area, from this small part. And uh, we have recently uh, visited an area which is in the northeastern fringe of the distribution area of the Nok culture uh, <clears throat> because we got some information that there are uh, regional styles that the Nok terracotta are not looking similar all over, but there are regional differences. Uh, in this area, this is the place where some farmers found fragments of terracotta a few weeks ago and they didn't know what to do with it. Not all uh, farmers are looters. Uh, people in this area, they are not aware of the economic value of the objects and they told us normally they throw it away because they don't know what to do with it. Uh, <clears throat> they um, allowed us to carry the fragments for uh, documentation because it's easy to identify that they looked different from what we know uh, from the Nok culture. We had started to refit the broken parts and got three uh, human sculptures which are uh, different from what is known from Nok so far. One is here. You see, it's a man with a crude face and a beard, uh, almost no decoration. And uh, on the right, uh, two men sitting on the pot, touching the back uh, to each other. Here, this is the largest object, uh, three men also fixed on a pot, shoulder uh, on shoulder. Uh, <clears throat> to avoid the complicated export of these materials to Europe and to document there, we use a new kind of documentation. Uh, maybe, I don't know whether the museum also make use of this structure from motion, is the method called. Uh, where the objects uh, are documented by a lot of photographies. Uh, if you see uh, here in the model later, the position of the individual photos can be localized, and uh, specific software uh, will calculate a three-dimensional model, and uh, from this model uh, allows to turn the object in any uh, position and to export uh, the position from... from uh, from all angles which are desired. Here, example of the uh, terracotta with three persons standing on a pot, shoulder on shoulder, between the arms are again snakes, and you see the crude face. Uh, the, our Nigerian uh, <coughs> collaborators call these the ugly knock. And the radiocarbon dates, which we got from uh, associated material from the interior, which in this case is really original deposit, because there is no fake, uh, is like the other date, it's middle knock, it's no, not what we originally thought, it's the beginning, and later they became more sophisticated. 
So it's uh, all the same time period. The model allows a close up uh, to export details, like here you see the snake between the, uh, placed between the bended arms of two humans and the face of one of the three humans, which uh, looks a little bit unfriendly. Uh, other software allows uh, to make uh, a film out of the model, uh, which you uh, see here, uh, which I think is a quite uh, suitable method to make documentation in the field. Okay, I hope I convinced you about the quality of this documentation. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> uh, I have shown you 34 terracotta, uh, but our documentation comprises several hundreds, and the documentation and analysis is a big job, and another big job is the understanding of the context of the terracotta, which um, I have... Uh, which I had in mind to show you here in more details, but I see the, my time is already over. So let me just summarize uh, that we, so far from the excavation, have two cases. And uh, one case simply is what we call the waste hypothesis, that uh, the fragments are lying to, fragments of the terracotta are lying together with ordinary waste material in the archaeological deposits. And we have no explanation other than simply the terracotta, after they had been used, they are somehow broken and they came uh, into context of uh, normally other waste materials in a settlement. The other, uh, the other case uh, is shown here. This is deliberately the position of intentionally broken terracotta. Uh, here an example we have excavated in 2011, which are quite rare to find because it's, you must be very lucky just to hit a place where uh, these kind of deposits uh, had been made. Here you see seven parts at one spot. Even here, no sculpture is complete. We have other examples, and the recent discovery is that um, very close to these uh, deposits, there are what we suppose to be burials. I mentioned that there are no bones survived in the acid uh, soil, uh, but uh, <clears throat> in some cases, and in the meantime really regularly associated with this kind of deposits, there are upright standing stones, sometimes grinding stones are involved, and next to these uh, stones are complete pots, very fine decorated pots, which one can assume they had not been used uh, uh, in, in, for, for cooking or for other daily use, uh, but possibly were used as uh, grave good from burials. Uh, th in one case, there is a, uh, a chain of stone beads still in an anatomically correct position as if it was placed around the neck. So the final proof, we just work uh, at the moment with uh, X-ray fluorescence analysis by sampling the ground uh, and trying to identify high concentration, for instance, of uh, phosphate and of calcium, uh, which will be accumulated if, uh, organic, uh, if organic material like a dead body decays. So at the moment, uh, concerning the explanation, uh, at least of those terracotta which had not become waste, could be that they are somehow related uh, to, uh, to burials. And this is what we will do uh, in the next years. Uh, we still have uh, five years' time uh, to continue our studies. We, um <clears throat> the harder you look, the more you will find. Also, you will not find what you are looking for. So there might be still some, uh, some discoveries we have not yet. And um, maybe in a few years, I will be allowed to come back to Yale and give a report on what has been uh, completed in the meantime. I thank you very much for your patience.
if oh I'm sorry no. um, a lot of the figurines wear beads it looks like string rather thick uh, strings of beads uh, you did mention beads of, of stone would that at all be uh, what is shown or what other explanation of uh, the beads would, would there be? Yeah, uh, we think that uh, beads, uh, stone beads, uh, definitely were used. There are enormous quantities. Sometimes the beads can be found in, uh, in pots which are buried in the ground, uh, even in this, what I, what I have uh, described as graves. Uh, but um, you, you are right. Uh, <clears throat> if there had been beads from organic material, we will not find them. There is no chance for organic material, uh, wood, bone, or, or other things, uh, to survive in, in this uh, in acid environment uh, for two and a half thousand years. Some of the stone beads, uh, in some, uh, for instance, necklaces, it's even the the separation of the individual beads oops, is indicated, and if you see the size, this probably can fit with the dimension of stone beads. But there, of course, there must be a, a, a lot of other materials which had been used for, for this decoration. Yes, hi. In, are there any arrangement you know, when you have all the sculptures like around or facing north, facing south? Is there anything you were able to find or just too fragmented? Uh, the, those pieces from, uh, from settlements have no clear orientation because they are not deposited. It's just by accidentally uh, to which side they are directed. And the deposits like the one here, uh, we have just a handful, and there is no clear indication that they face north, south, or whatsoever. This didn't. This uh, uh, art just doesn't appear the, this sophisticated. Do you? Can you speculate on what pre knock was? If we go from. Uh, Oh, uh, 2,500 years ago. Does this go back? And uh, the second question I had was, uh, do you see any Egyptian influence in this art? Uh, let me start with the second one. Uh, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's very simple. Um, you might find some parallels by the gesture of, the, of, the, of some of the terracottas. But if you imagine the distance in between, and in 2,000 years ago, or 2,500 years ago, the Sahara Desert was more or less what it is today. It was green, and uh, people could move in early and middle Holocene times. But in these days, there was really a frontier between, or, or, an, or, or an inaccessible belt between uh, Egypt and, and this area. At least in a way that you cannot explain that all these things were influenced by, uh, by Egypt. Uh, the other question, we, we, Nock is the oldest large-scale uh, terracotta art in sub-Saharan Africa. There is nothing known from earlier periods. That doesn't mean that it is the birth of art as it was indicated by a book here. Of art in Africa has an antiquity which possibly goes back 70,000 if not 100,000 years by the production of uh, pigments, by the decoration of hematite stones with some kind of linear pattern, or even uh, rock, uh, <coughs> rock um, pictures or, or engravings uh, which have an age of 30,000 30, years uh, in southern Africa. Uh, but concerning sculptural art, uh, we don't so far know anything which uh, could be served as a predecessor of, um, of the Nocteracotta. Did you find any exotic materials in any of your excavations to indicate trade with other areas? No. Very simple, no. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi. Uh, are there any plans that uh, you with your university connections in Germany and your working with the National Commission for Museums and Monuments in Nigeria to build a decent exhibition either in the Nock area or at the Joss Museum for educational purposes using yeah. some of this material? Yeah. yeah, definitely. This is on the way at the moment. Uh, Barbara Blankenstein, I mentioned the exhibition we had in Germany. Uh, 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 this was simply, uh, the idea was to show this to the German publicity, uh, because uh, public, because they, uh, they funded uh, all our uh, studies. And uh, all the materials had, had been brought back to Nigeria in the meantime. They are in Kaduna. There is a political decision that the exhibition should be shown in Kaduna. Uh, we only wait for the whole uh, exhibition display material, which is more difficult to repatriate than the terracotta. And then the, the National Commission has um, renovated the museum in Kaduna. The gallery is much larger than it has been before and uh, ready to carry this exhibition uh, as a constant, uh, a permanent exhibition then. And of course, all the information about our research will be uh, will be uh, will be included. Thank you for sharing this wonderful information. I'm wondering if you find any connection between the Nock Eye and the Yoruba Eye Scul <laughs> in sculptural style. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, this um, um, this I was told several times that the knock eye is very similar to the Yoruba <laughs> to the eye of those Yoruba uh, objects, uh, but I don't know whether your question has in mind to argue that there is a relation or at least a development from knock to Yoruba. I think this is an overestimation of similarities. Uh, after Nock, there is one millennium where we have no other materials uh, in Nigeria uh, of this kind. The next one is Ile Ife, and to Yoruba there still is another few centuries uh, time gap in between. So it's they, they are similar, but that does not mean that they have some kind of uh, inspiration or, or at least a genetic relation. I wasn't, oh, well, when you add genetic, that makes a difference to the rest of what you said. But if the people looked similar, perhaps their illustrations would be similar. The makers of the statuary. But the eyes are not looking, no, nowhere in the world, the eyes are looking like the one which had been depicted by the Nock people. It's a semicircle. Yeah, not the oval-shaped eye. Mm -hmm. or, did I or did I not understand your question correct? Perhaps you did, and perhaps we see the sculpture differently. <laughs> you, you mentioned um, furnaces, and I know you didn't have time to go into the iron, but do you have, can you say anything about the distribution of furnaces? Are they as widely scattered? as the terracotta, which, or, or do you think that terracotta was more made in certain places and then distributed? Uh, thank you for this question, because you mentioned two aspects. I could not go into details. This is a lecture for its own. The, <coughs> the manufacture of terracotta, originally we thought that there had been central, uh, central uh, 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 manufacture places. Uh, this is a long story uh, because the clay of the terracotta or the geochemical fingerprint of the clay is very similar. Yeah, all terracotta, even maybe uh, we can use that uh, as a kind of test whether it's a fake or an original one. All those authentic pieces had been measured by X ray uh, fluorescence analysis, and the clay is very, very similar. And for this reason, we supposed that there had been central places where these terracotta had been produced. But we haven't found these places so far. And if you, if, you, if you have in mind, it was one spot where they took the clay, 
This must be a big hole in the landscape which everybody should know. So these places do not exist. In the meantime, there is, this was the result of a PhD. Um, the idea is that the terracotta were made by specialists, but not in centralized places. They were, uh, let's say, walking around, going to the individual villages and offer their service. While the other pottery objects, the clay vessels, were made locally and uh, individually in the villages because the clay differs from one side to the other. Uh, iron uh, is a PhD which will be completed in a few weeks. Uh, and uh, we, have, um, we have abundant quantities of furnaces, simply for the reason that the furnaces are not in danger. You can't make money out of that. Uh, and uh, since now our informants in the area know that we do not only look for knock sites and knock terracotta, that we also are interested in this kind of circles, which still can be seen all over the landscapes. Uh, whenever I come, they show us dozens of new sites uh, where there are furnaces. We know how the knock furnaces are looking like. It's not a, a even is the earliest iron production in this part of Africa. Maybe they should be very small or at least show evidence of an experimental stage. But they are very large, yeah? one meter and more in diameter. But the wall is only preserved seldom, uh, in, 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 in rarely more than half a meter. The furnaces are not isolated. There is always a whole group. We have excavations where up to seven furnaces are one to, to each other. Uh, probably dated into the knock period, uh, so the amount of uh, iron production was enormous. And there is no specific location to, uh, in relation to settlement. They are everywhere, uh, but geographical information system analysis possibly will show that there are some specific environmental condition, proximity to water, to uh, to uh, f wood because enormous enormous quantities of charcoal uh, is needed, or to uh, to the to the uh, places where the ore uh, was taken from. So the iron uh, more exciting uh, than this might be that uh, the iron technology is slightly younger than the production of the of the terracotta. So it was not that. The production of iron, I think once this was one of those hypotheses, uh, caused the manufacture of terracotta because people now know how to deal high temperatures and that the production of terracotta was a kind of a byproduct. It's quite clear that the old dates we have for iron metallurgy are in the calibration plateau. That means between 800 and 400 BC, while there are a few radiocarbon dates which are before the plateau. I mentioned that between 800 and 900. So uh, iron is younger than the terracotta, but it is still among the very early horizon in sub-Saharan Africa. And the big question is, w did they invent it, or was it imported from somewhere else? In, in the corpus of iron objects that you have, is it, it's mostly weapons? Or do, no. you have, do you have ornaments? <coughs> there are almost no complete objects made out of iron. We just have an, uh, a, a, a bracelet, uh, a small uh, axe, and the other parts are broken and in many cases not more than just a little bit of rust. Totally recycling of uh, material which was highly expensive. In some of the examples that you showed, uh, the terracotta is quite red with what looks like confetti, white speckles throughout it. What, what exactly is that? Yeah, this is temper. <clears throat> this is very typical. If you once get one where this kind of temper is not involved, don't buy it. Yeah? The temper is necessary for, for the production. Uh, <clears throat> if you don't use it, the, the clay will crack during firing. It's, <coughs> it's very typical, but um, uh, originally, this kind of temper was not visible. They all were, were slipped by a fine clay uh, material, which is preserved 
when the terracotta were found deep in the ground, one meter and more, then this is still there. If it is in the, in the upper levels of the deposits, this fine grained material simply is disappeared by soil formation processes. And then they look like this here where you can see all this confetti. Sorry if I missed this, uh, if you said it before, but did you mention what purpose these terracotta served at the time that they were created? That's a big question. <laughs> Meaning, you know, you do you get what I'm saying? Like, why did they create them? Yeah. Why are there so many? Because it doesn't seem like, they're not like true to life figures of people who actually existed, right? And they don't actually look religious. Yeah. And, but there are a lot of them. Yeah. And they're very well made. Yeah. So why would they make them? You know, like we don't do that in our day and age. We don't just go around making figurines, <laughs> you know? Like, why did they do that then? <laughs> That's definitely the big question behind all these studies. <clears throat> but, uh, well, as in many other cases in, in prehistory, uh, you hardly can give a final explanation because they don't tell us. Yeah? Even the whole of the rock art in Africa, why did they make all these paintings, thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands of engravings all over in Africa? We don't know, uh, actually, but of course we have our ideas. And... Um, <clears throat> The, it was the home that the context in which we find the terracotta give us some idea. But there is no context where, which makes which tells you the story. This is the this is the reason why we produce them. Yeah, it could be. Um, uh, f we believe that it somehow has, of course, a ritual purpose, which was in uh, Ancaster uh, worship uh, located. The snakes are involved. The snakes are also very often related to uh, to this kind of worship. I have a question on the and then you have one more, and I think then we round up. But I wanted to ask: Have you ever thought, you and your team, that this sort of these heaps of broken sculptures could relate to some iconoclastic? You know, if you think what hap what's happening in the Near East or what happened uh, in Tibuktu, could it be, have you ever thought about that possibility? That maybe, you know, it was destroyed by some other people, civilization, breaking in, destroying the sites? And then buried carefully in the ground? <laughs> Probably not, you're right. <laughs> well, you know, we have, uh, I couldn't show you. I overestimated uh, the time I, I was allowed to speak. There is one a similar, a similar object like this here. Uh, maybe I still can. This is another one. Uh, but there is another one where we can reconstruct what has happened. Yeah? And it simply was that first they are, the terracotta are broken, uh, intentionally damaged. <clears throat> but then not the whole terracotta is buried in the ground always a few parts. The other parts were taken somewhere else. Yeah? Uh, if you are uh, under violence and you want to destroy something from somebody else, why should you take out from each a few and carry it home or uh, carry it somewhere else? Then, um, then they were deposited in a flat pit and then they made a big fire because we found enormous quantities of charcoal. Uh, and finally, the whole, the mixture between the fragmented uh, terracotta and the charcoal is carefully sealed with a plaster of stones. So this looks, you want to get rid of these materials because they had fulfilled their purpose and they should not come back. This is uh, somehow the intention. And this uh, is hard to be explained by, uh, by um, others who destroyed uh, the materials. Okay, so I think we round up. Thank you very much for coming and for your interest. If you have further questions, we can discuss them.